Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr Ron Ehrlich. All disease is caused by oxidative stress. All cancers are a focus of chronic inflammation and chronic oxidative stress. Too much calcium is a problem. Too much iron is a problem. What are the four basic and must-have supplements? Why is oral health the hidden epidemic? What about vitamin C? Why has it been described as the universal panacea? Well, my guest today is Dr. Thomas E. Levy. Thomas is a board-certified cardiologist, the author of Primal Panacea and Curing the Incurable, Vitamin C, Infectious Diseases and Toxins, plus three other groundbreaking medical books. Thomas is one of the world's leading vitamin C experts and frequently lectures to medical professionals all over the globe, including in Australia, about the proper role of vitamin C and antioxidants in the treatment of a host of medical conditions and diseases. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Thomas Levy. Welcome to the show, Thomas. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thomas, you have uh, quite a journey through law, cardiology, you've written books on dental disease and the con connection to health. It's quite a journey. Can you just run us through your own journey to this point? Well, I was a traditional mainstream cardiologist up until about 1993 when I met Dr. Hal Huggins in Colorado Springs. And for a number of reasons, I was open to a change, uh, and I wasn't anticipating on meeting somebody like Dr. Huggins. But anyway, he invited me to his clinic to see what was going on. <clears throat> and I guess you might say that was the beginning of the end, or the beginning of the beginning. Right. Because um, <clears throat> I saw a large number of really critically ill patients uh, getting many hours of Extensive dental work, extractions, etc., crowns, all over that period of time, and then feeling really great afterwards. And it just didn't add up to me because I knew kids in college that went and got a couple wisdom teeth out and they went home and went to bed for a week. So it just didn't add up. And I said, Hal, what's going on here? And Hal, if you ever had a chance to know him, had a pretty uh, devilish sense of humor and a sarcasm not matched by any. And he just pointed to the IV. And I said, okay, if that's fine, Hal, I, I'm familiar with IVs. Uh, so you're saying an IV did it? And he said, well, no, it's what's in it. I said, okay, I'll bite. What's in it? And he said, 50 grams of vitamin C. And that caught me completely out of left field. And I immediately resolved that I was going to start learning about vitamin C, all its history, what it's doing, the literature, etc. And along with all the other stuff Hal had to offer knowledge wise, I like to say that was the beginning of my real medical education that everything else had just been the preparation for. And so over the course of the subsequent whew, 23 or so years up until now, uh, it's been quite a journey, a number of books, a number of projects. At one point in time, I began working for Dr. Huggins as a consultant, and he paid me well enough, and I had enough time off that after watching all the brutal suits and everything else that he got harassed with so frequently – that he had a lawyer on staff, uh, I just decided that I was going to go ahead and get my law degree. Of course. Why not? <laughs> well, why not? Why not? <laughs> and I look at these law books today, and I don't know how I did it. I mm. mean, I just said, you actually read that stuff and committed it to memory. But anyway, you know, it all depends what time it is in your life, what you're prepared for, what you're motivated for. There's, there's no way I could do it now, but I did it then. And I will say uh, it hasn't been maybe overwhelmingly significant, but it has had a great deal of impact on the way I analyze things, the way I write, 
uh, I think it's offered me, oftentimes without me even knowing it, a certain amount of protection that Hal didn't have. And so, and so I don't regret it at all, uh, you know, uh, being a physician and then a lawyer. Uh, I always like to joke when I talk to the audiences that I talk to that I say, you know, I'm thinking now of becoming a dentist so I can become finally a group of every, uh, a, a, a member of every group I hold in the lowest esteem. <laughs> So, wow. Well, now as a dentist, thanks for saying that. Uh, I've just put me well, right at it. <laughs> but, but now listen, just, just going back a little bit, because 1993, you'd already been in practice for how long as a cardiologist, doctor uh, and cardiologist? Uh, well, I'll do my math quick. Probably 13 or 14 years as a cardiologist, something like that. I, I was on the faculty at Tulane until 1983, uh, closer to 20 years, I guess. Mm. And no, so, no. I'm done, I'm closer to 15 years. Right. And so this whole discovering the mouth, uh, because its I've always said it's a little bit of a black hole in healthcare, isn't it? I mean, doctors know very little about it, and dentists are so focused on the minutia they don't realise there's a body attached to these people. So it's quite a revelation, really, isn't it, to discover there's a mouth with all sorts of things going on. Yeah, I like the reference to it as a black hole. It's sort of that <laughs> literally and figuratively, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, uh, and and uh, so, I mean, I know Hal Huggins was it was a very interesting character. I did get to do some of his courses in the uh, late eighties, early nineties, so I did get to meet him. Uh, what was so, now? You've said so much here. I mean, the vitamin C is obviously something that I want to talk to you about. In fact, let's talk about that a bit because uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, when they get a cold or they feel one coming on, they feel, oh, I just must grab a bit of vitamin C and I'll be right. But there's a lot more to it than that, isn't there? Uh, there are many faces of vitamin C, <laughs> to coin a phrase. Uh, can you just run us through a little bit of basics for the beginner before we dive into it a bit more? Yes, and uh, it's a good question. I'm glad you asked it because, and I certainly wasn't in this spot 20 years ago or even 15 years ago, but you, you stick at something long enough, certain patterns and facts and things begin to emerge. And all my presentations now circulate around the fact that I present the data that Vitamin C is actually the primary fuel on which every cell in the body runs. And this is because as an antioxidant, it's an electron donor. And that's significant because even though people have talked about oxidation and oxidative stress and all these catchphrases for a long period of time, it now becomes apparent to me, has become apparent to me, that all disease is not necessarily caused by increased oxidative stress, it is increased oxidative stress. In other words, when you oxidize a biomolecule, nucleic acid, protein, sugar, you name it, nucleic acid, it becomes dysfunctional or afunctional. Either It either operates at a lesser efficiency or it doesn't have its biological function at all. And as such, then, the more biomolecules that are oxidized in different areas of the body, different concentrations, etc., that determines your disease process. And the degree to which vitamin C can go into the tissues and re-donate electrons so that oxidized biomolecules are reduced and functional again is the degree to which a disease can be controlled or even use the dirty word cured. OK, and then the other side of the coin is what's causing the oxidation and 100 percent of the oxidation is caused by toxins. Toxins are all prooxidant. Prooxidants are all toxins. So when you put this picture together, you, you realize then that vitamin C is your ultimate antitoxin. It will literally in the blood neutralize a toxin or immediately repair the damage after the toxin goes into the tissues, takes away some electrons from a biomolecule, reducing itself while it oxidizes the biomolecule, and then you have your toxic damage. Uh, so it's, it's elegantly simple, but still, I believe, 100% correct. You know, there's so many enzymes, so many pathways. I mean, biology is incredibly complex, incredibly involved. 
yet there exist these final common denominator pathways, in my point of view, linking it to all disease, 100% of disease. And this is why not only vitamin C, but any antioxidant, if it has the chemical structure to allow it to get in proper opposition to the oxidized biomolecule that needs to be reduced, you'll get clinical improvement. And of course, and I'm sure we'll be touching upon it later, the maybe even bigger half of the coin, if you will, or, or more important side of the coin, is the fact that you have to identify and reduce, preferably stop, the exposure to new toxins on a daily basis. And that, of course, brings us to the mouth, which for many reasons we might get a chance to go into. I will tell you quite comfortably that's the primary source of disease-causing and disease-promoting toxins in the vast majority of people on the planet today. Wow. Well, the Thomas music to my ears, of course, This, uh, com but coming from a cardiologist, that's quite a statement to hear. But let's just back up because I do want to get on to the – will, we will be talking, obviously, about this dental uh, connection, but I want to stick with this vitamin C – um, because uh, you've, you've mentioned its importance. It's interesting, really, because we've done quite a few programs on cancer as a metabolic disease, you know, and, uh, and I think this kind of dovetails in rather nicely with that concept that rather than look for genetic uh, drivers for all these things, there's something about cell metabolism that manifests itself depending on your genetic predisposition in a various disease. I mean... The diseases that show up are a genetic manifestation of it, but the drivers are very similar. And that's basically what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah. In the case of cancer, I'll perhaps oversimplify things a bit, but I think bring it into focus, hmm. is really virtually all cancers are foci or start as foci of chronically increased oxidative stress, a.k.a. inflammation, along with a chronic inflammatory response that will never disappear because if the inflammation doesn't disappear, the immune system response doesn't. And then when you throw into the uh, mix, if you will, uh, excess iron and excess calcium, these are both primarily pro-oxidant, and I'll say it, uh, carcinogenic presences, okay? These ramp up the intracellular oxidative stress to a point where <clears throat> the, the cell becomes either just chronically diseased or reaches enough increased oxidative stress that it undergoes a malignant transformation. And so point being then is <clears throat> everything of what I've already said pretty much applies to cancer. It's just that cancer is just... Uh, higher on the feeding list, if you will. It's going to be one of the worst things that's going to result when these factors of increased inflammation, chronic oxidative stress are not addressed early enough uh, if you don't die of an infection or something else in the meantime, then ultimately cancer is going to end up being your lot in life. Mm. <clears throat> well, it is for many, many people, as we know. I think the statistics are one in two men, one in three women over the age of 60 or 65. Listen, um, just coming back, because you mentioned increased iron, increased calcium, because I wanted to ask you about dairy. Uh, we get bombarded constantly by dairy is important. We need calcium for healthy bones. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> well, you need a lot of things for healthy bones, and calcium is just one of them. And the approach seems to be that all you need to do is provide calcium and you're going to have healthy bones, which, of course, is ridiculously asinine as a scientific concept. Yet uh, we seem to have science more by marketing than we have science by science. Now, what happens in the case of calcium is, if you will, osteoporosis is like a, well, an oxidation, a burning up of the bony matrix and calcium is in the smoke. Okay, so 
putting putting smoke back into burn wood isn't going to make intact wood and putting back calcium into heavily oxidized bone is not going to make healthy bone. Ironically enough, it will make bone that, and this is a great deception, looks a little bit better on the bone density tests. But it's purely cosmetic, just as if you put a uh, layer of paint on a rotting fence. The fence will look a little bit better, but if you lean against it, it'll still break. So bottom line is all the studies show that calcium as a mono supplement, mono supplement has no effect at all in decreasing fracture incidence, which is, of course, your ultimate parameter as to whether or not you're having a positive effect. And to make it worse, and this is covered, of course, in the book Death by Calcium, there is a incredibly large number of studies showing not only does calcium supplementation increase your chance of death from all causes, it can arguably be considered a primary above a certain level, a primary carcinogenic substance because no cancer cell becomes malignant without substantially increased oxidative stress. And no substantially increased oxidative stress occurs in isolation without the presence of an excess of calcium intracellularly. So calcium is important just as iron is, just as copper is, at certain low levels, I call them the three toxic nutrients. They're vital for life, and above a certain level, they're vital for death. Uh, it helps the body self-regulate. I mean, the body has to learn and know <clears throat> under given circumstances just, as, just how they're going to kill a cell as if they're going to nurture a cell. And one of the main ways a cell is put into uh, apoptosis is by manipulation, either intentionally or unintentionally, these levels of iron, calcium, and copper. So bottom line is, you get all the calcium you need by a balanced diet with the proper levels of vitamin D circulating in your blood. 50 to 60 to 80 to 90 nanogram per cc, and you're gonna do fine. Now does that mean you still won't get osteoporosis? No. Osteoporosis is caused by a lot of things, but the thing osteoporosis is not caused by is a calcium deficiency. And, but, we, but because calcium is low in osteoporotic bone, we immediately get branded as having a calcium deficiency, even though all that calcium that got mobilized from the bone as it had, it, had its oxidative burn, it deposited throughout the cells of the body. And any cell that starts having extracellular metastatic calcification is in bad shape. And this is why the coronary artery calcium score, which was long, has long been considered a gold standard for telling you what your chances were of having a heart attack. Well, guess what? Coronary artery calcium is also an index of how readily you've been depositing calcium throughout your body, not just in the coronary arteries, and lo and behold, it's now clearly established that the coronary artery calcium score, the higher it is, the greater your all-cause mortality risk. In other words, the greater your chance of death from anything. Now, if you have a greater chance of death from anything, it's because all the cells are affected. And that's why the calcium is such a widely toxic substance is because it affects the health of every cell in your body. Wow. Now, one of our very first um, podcasts at the beginning of this year was with uh, Ross Walker, uh, a cardiologist, integrative cardiologist in Sydney. Do you know Ross? Uh, no, no, I don't. Sir. Anyway, he was very big on this coronary calcium CT score. In fact, he said anything over 400, don't read Tolstoy. Um, you know, he was <laughs> kind of, uh, is there any way of reversing that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, this is covered in my book as well, but you have what I call the big four supplements, which are magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin D, and vitamin K. Each one of those supplements independently as a mono supplement decreases all-cause mortality. And it decreases all mortality because it mobilizes calcium 
from these calcium deposits, gets it out of your body, and decreases intracellular calcium. Uh, and although I don't have a, a large list, I have many people that have reported back to me that when they start seriously uh, taking good supplements in general, but heralded by these what I call four super supplements, there are many good supplements, but I don't think anybody should be on a supplement regimen that does not at least contain these four things. And when you do that, you mobilize your calcium, you excrete it out your urine, these deposits shrink, and uh, you actually can get some reversal uh, of atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, and in any of the diseases, because all, all, nearly all cancers, for example, are associated with, and many you can show some degree of cause and effect that as the calcium deposits in the metastatic spots throughout your body, that heavily ramps up the uh, increased oxidative stress that's so characteristic of carcinogenesis. Mm. Well, you know, this podcast is, uh, is is a hell of an indulgence for me because after that uh, after that statement, Ross is uh, my cardiologist, I went and had mine done and my calcium CT score was 650. Thomas, God, am I, am I alive here to talk to you? It, it's amazing I'm even here talking to you. But, but, you know, so that was pretty high and I immediately put down Tolstoy. I was just starting the book and it uh, put me off the book. But uh, that, that's a high. So, so vitamin D, calcium, uh, vitamin D, K, magnesium, vitamin C, they are the big ones. They're the big ones, They're yes, big sir. Ones. Now, tell me, iron. You mentioned elevated iron as well as being another driver. Where, where, well, tell us the iron story here. <clears throat> Wow, the iron story is so depressingly maddening, it drives me crazy every time I tell it. Okay. Uh, since the early 1940s, our public health geniuses, by our, I mean in the United States, uh, apparently had a realization that there's a large number of children throughout the third world countries where they never get anything decent to eat had high levels of iron deficiency anemia. And they just decided in their incredible wisdom that, well, we're going to make sure no United States children have iron deficiency anemia. And then they started putting iron in everything. Now, that was bad enough as it was because no form of supplemental iron is good for you <clears throat> if your basic ferritin level is normal and you don't have an iron deficiency anemia. Anything extra is highly toxic. Well, they not only decided all these foods that you see that are fortified or enriched. And I have a video on this. If people want to go to YouTube and type in my name, Dr. Levy Iron Video, you will be appalled. because. And this has not changed because that was done 25 years ago and I've redone it a few months ago. It's the same thing. And that is get an enriched cereal soak it, break it up, blenderize it, and then pass a magnet over a bag outside of it, and you will pull out a fistful of raw metallic iron filings. Okay? Mm -hmm. And incredibly enough, and I, I don't know if this is a, a statement on the ignorance of the world or a stupid belief that we actually do things correctly in the United States, but the entire world has followed suit on this. So this enrichment, quote unquote, of the foods is present everywhere throughout the world. Ironically enough, and this takes us to a slightly related situation and one that I had to live through myself before I inadvertently started realizing all of this, is that in my opinion, the primary benefit of a gluten-free diet is the fact that nearly all the gluten-free foods are iron-free and they don't add iron to them. So the moment you go truly gluten-free, you start going added iron-free and the leaky gut syndrome that you invariably get when you take a toxic substance like iron on a daily basis with every meal, that can start to heal. And as it heals, 
Uh, if it heals completely, you can start digesting gluten and everything else. If it heals to a lesser degree, you at least become less sensitive uh, and your gluten sensitivity is much more readily managed. But it became very apparent to me that, to my satisfaction anyway, that the primary benefit of a gluten-free diet was it gave your gut a chance to heal. I mean, we start this iron assault on our bottle-fed babies. So from the first food they have outside of mother's milk and mother's breast, they start developing a rotten gut. And, you know, you look at babies, they eat something, they cry, they scream, they have indigestion. We just kind of accept this as normal. But it's not. Guess what? Babies are designed to have a meal and then not be miserable. But you wouldn't know that uh, from most circumstances. Yeah, so what, what the, the bottle feeding part of it is the, is the count, what, what are you saying about that bottle feeding? <clears throat> well, depending on, uh, depending on the manufacturer, you have different forms of iron. All oh, of them are the toxic. Iron, the iron supplementation not, within the, the, bottle, the, the uh, formula, the enriched. Uh, sorry, repeat the question. What? The, iron, the iron supplementation within the, within the uh, um, uh, formula. Well, I'm saying there's uh, pyrophosphate, there's ferrous sulfate, there's a number of different types of iron they put in there. Mm. Uh, I don't know if they have metallic iron filings in the baby formula. I know they have it in virtually all of the cereals. So as soon as the baby graduates to something that they can chew on a little bit, they'll start ingesting the metallic iron filings as well, which really it's important to realize is just an added layer of toxicity because above a normal level of iron, it's all toxic and it will, and it will, I mean, look, you know, you're, you've uh, probably run into lots of people or friends, family, friends. They start taking an iron supplement and they get an upset stomach. Guess what? <laughs> their, their stomach is reacting the way it should react to something that starts poisoning the lining of the stomach. So iron has no place at all in anything other than your food or if you have an iron deficiency anemia and you're going to take a limited course of iron until the anemia corrects itself, assuming you haven't found an underlying reason for the anemia like blood loss and a gastric ulcer or a cancer or something like that. Now, let's just go back to vitamin C because um, obviously it's so important. What kinds of vi what should we be taking? What kind, of, what kind of types of vitamin C are there and what, should, what works and what doesn't? Well, vitamin C is really the ascorbate anion. OK, ascorbic acid is hydrogen ascorbate, sodium, sodium ascorbate, magnesium ascorbate, potassium ascorbate, calcium ascorbate. That's one you should avoid. But there's a, a, a lot of it out there. Well, wow, there is a lot. Uh, I mean, that's a very and, common supplement. And it's 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 advertised and it's true that it's easy on the stomach. So it doesn't aggravate your stomach like ascorbic acid. But guess what? Sodium ascorbate doesn't either. So you do fine taking sodium ascorbate, steer clear of the calcium ascorbate. You have uh, a fat-soluble form of vitamin C known as ascorbyl palmitate. Uh, and you have these different delivery forms. One of them, uh, and I've worked with the company for probably 13 years and done a lot of clinical work with their product. And... Properly liposome encapsulated vitamin C is incredibly beneficial because most people, including docs, still get confused and think that the benefit of liposomes is to get more vitamin C in your blood. No, no, no. It's designed to get more vitamin C inside your cells because the membrane of the liposomes is identical to the membrane of every cell in your body. So once it gets absorb which it gets absorbed very easily the tinier liposomes pass straight into the cell the larger liposomes have a reverse pinocytosis and merge with them all with the merge with the wall and deposit their contents directly in but we still seem hung up on looking at blood levels when you're talking about blood levels it's irrelevant with liposomes the big problem with liposomes is not liposomes per se 
but the incredible amount of fraud in the liposome business. Okay, they have every Tom, Dick, and Harry seeing the success of Live On Labs, who started liposome some 13 years ago and goes to tremendous lengths to have a quality control and production. They're just throwing garbage out there right and left. And that's bad enough, but the real bad thing about it is you have a lot of desperate patients, as you well know, and for them, a properly liposome encapsulated product can do a lot of good. And so when they take one of these fraudulent products, which unfortunately, believe it or not, is the majority of them, and they don't get the result they want or they're hoping for, then they say, oh, well, liposomes have failed me. Well, they haven't, of course, because they haven't taken liposomes. Hmm. So uh, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, they have uh, – a matter of fact, I was down in Australia several weeks ago, uh, and we talked about this product. It's available in New Zealand. If people are interested online, it's liveonlabs.com, L-I-V-O-N-L-A-B-S.com. Hmm. Then, of course, there's intravenous, okay, and there's intramuscular. Okay, and all of these are different ways of achieving the goal of trying to optimize intracellular levels of reduced vitamin C. And uh, I don't want to <laughs> disrupt or deflect things too much, but, but we also now, very, very recently, uh, a colleague of mine introduced me to this stuff, and we've been doing some research with it. It now appears we have a supplement, a nutrient polyphenol that unmasks the galonolactone oxidase gene in the human being, and we're seeing human beings now able to synthesize their own vitamin C. So whatever other forms of supplementation you take, if you have a background of being able to still continually put a little vitamin C in your system while using up your glucose, which is what you synthesize it from, that's a super double whammy, uh, and I've already seen some pretty amazing results with this product. So all of those are different ways of getting your vitamin C levels up, keeping them up, and the studies are crystal clear. The higher your plasma concentrations of vitamin C, the longer you live, plain and simple. Well, okay. So, <clears throat> get it, well, let's talk about dosages. I mean, if someone was, shall we say, healthy, uh, whatever that means in today's world, but, but uh, you know, uh, if someone w didn't have a diagnosable disease and was feeling good, wh where should they be at? And then as they progress through the disease process, w w how do these dosages vary? Oh, they vary widely. Hmm. Uh, for one reason, uh, when we talk about the average healthy person, before we call someone healthy, I have to first say they can't be on any prescription medications and be considered healthy. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, if they're on prescription medications, then they need the 3D cone beam exam of their mouth to see if there's any infected teeth. Because one infected tooth brings everything down, skyrockets your body-wide oxidative stress, and just uh, brings everything potentially bad into your life. Now, if your mouth is relatively clean, there's no chronically infected tonsils from previously chronically infected teeth that were later addressed because tonsils tend to get infected and stay infected even though they characteristically look normal. If let's just say for the sake of argument, all that is addressed well, and very importantly, you have a normal CRP, C-reactive protein. If your C-reactive protein is less than one, I mean, they call the normal range or the reference range zero to three, three is much too high. You want to see a C-reactive protein reflective of a relatively low body-wide level of oxidative stress, less than one. And so with that type of scenario, Taking one or two grams, one or two packets of this live on vitamin C should take care of your needs fairly well. Uh, if you find that's not desirable or it's not available or it's too expensive, a lot of people have taken care of themselves for very many years now with plain old vitamin C powder and capsules. I would advise powder or capsules. I mean, it's just 
no point in taking pills, okay? Pills just bring a whole different factor uh, and, and deprive you of rapid action and purity of action when you're taking a good powder or a good capsule. And in those people, they, it's good to work out what's called the bowel tolerance, okay? So the first time you do this, you take a level teaspoon every hour or so with a lot of water until you poop. And if that's 10, 12, 14 grams, take four-fifths of that dose on a daily basis in divided amounts, okay? And that's a good amount to take. Now, having said that, there's nothing wrong, quite the contrary, with doing what's called a sea flush on a daily basis. I did that for many years. But, you know, you have to be uh, either somebody working at home or you got to be the boss so that you have your own bathroom and all that sort of thing because until you get used to your body and how it reacts, you don't want you don't want to be in the middle of a situation where you don't have that type of access. But it neutralizes gut toxins as they develop. And believe me, gut toxins are an enormous source of contribution to increase oxidative stress throughout the body. So, I mean, I consider the mouth and secondarily the constipated gut to be your greatest sources of uh, toxins. Uh, compromising your body-wide uh, oxidative stress levels. Yeah, I want to get on to the dental part of it, but just on the on, when we start doing I, IV, uh, yeah, talk to us a little bit about how how what uh, what the best protocol is for the IV. Well, the protocols are evolving. I mean, for many years now, led by Dr. Klenner at the mm, Reardon Clinic and other places around the world, you'd get uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, 25, 50 grams, 75 grams intravenously, and this would work very well. However, we've had some very recent things occur in the last year or so, some work on vitamin C and sepsis, and we're now beginning to see that much smaller doses of vitamin C given more frequently appears to have perhaps a superior effect, okay? Uh, in other words, uh, 50 grams given over an hour versus 2 grams given IV push every two hours for uh, four or five doses, it would appear preliminarily that those 10 grams given as intermittent IV pushes might be having a more significant impact than the 50 grams all at once. Hmm. So there's a lot of things we're playing with uh, at the Reardon Clinic too. They developed a little bladder where they can hook you up and you can get a steady infusion over a 24-hour period. <clears throat> this was something that Dr. Kletter talked about many years ago as perhaps having an even better effect on cancer and other chronic degenerative diseases. And I think he was right, but I think having this steady, low-grade infusion, followed by whenever somebody's in the office, they don't have to, you know, be in the hospital, you know, just come by the office three or four times and just get a little additional IV push on top of that, I think you're going to start seeing some even greater things. And believe me, vitamin C has already done some pretty great things the way it's been done. But it's ironic because I don't know if you're aware of this, probably, that we've had a worldwide shortage of IV fluids for quite a few years now. Mm. No, I'm not. Go on. And, and, I mean, you just can't order all the bags of sterile water and normal saline you want, not even the hospitals. So this has actually pushed us into evolving, evalu evaluating areas we might not have evaluated otherwise. And Dr. Honey Hackey and I, I'm a consultant to the Reardon Clinic. I don't live in Wichita. Uh, we've developed some protocols where we can give 5, 10, 15, 25 grams of vitamin C IV push over a minute or two or three or four minutes, no more. Mm. And by also 
adding things, and I want anybody listening to understand this is experimental and investigational now, but by adding things like 25 to 50 milligrams of hydrocortisone to the IV push and one, two, three, four units of humulin insulin to the IV push, both insulin and hydrocortisone by separate mechanisms uh, substantially increase the uptake of vitamin C inside the cell. And as I mentioned before, that's the bottom line and that's the target. How much reduced vitamin C can we get inside the affected cells is going to determine your short and your long-term recovery. Hmm. Gee, and that and that intravenous is is uh, sodium ascorbate. Well, it's sodium ascorbate. Ideally, the ideal form is if you can get uh, a pharmacy to formulate for you sodium ascorbate powder dissolved in um, a sterile water. Uh, and then a pH comes in at perfect, like 7271. Uh, the commercially available vials are ascorbic acid buffered with sodium bicarbonate, which eventually, which actually brings it to be sodium ascorbate, but to a pH as low as five and a half up to up to seven. So if you have the regular vials and you have a sensitive patient, I mean, for example, I'm not sensitive to it at all. I can, I can use the, uh, the McGuff intravenous preparation as is with no problems. Some oftentimes ladies with smaller veins, they're more sensitive. And it's very important in them to try to get your pH as perfectly adjusted at between 7 to 7.4 as possible. So in that case, you know, uh, if you're preparing an IV bag or if you're preparing an IV push, you just add a few cc's of the standard 8.4% injection of sodium bicarb, mix it, and then squeeze out a drop or two on pH paper and see if you're getting it close to that pH of 7. But the bottom line is... You, People may talk about ascorbic acid infusion. Believe me, nobody uh, infuses ascorbic acid. It'll burn. It'll burn your vein up in a second. Mm. They're talking about ascorbic acid that's been properly buffered. Yeah. Now, knowing everything, before we move on to the dental connection, knowing everything you know, what's your protocol on a daily? Or you know, how often are you having your vitamin C and all of that? Well, I have a I have my little pill box packs that I have a. Oh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 milligrams of magnesium 3 and 8, some vitamin K2, uh, the vitamin D that I've, I've found has brought my blood level into the right range. In my case, it's about 7,000 units a day. Uh, Iodorol for my thyroid, the iodine preparation, uh, and um, also... Uh, pantothene, which is a form of vitamin D5, which is very good for energy production. Uh, my direct vitamin C intake is kind of variable. I, I don't have a straightforward take X amount, but uh, some days it'll be a few packs of liposome C. Other days it'll be a, uh, a few uh, low, low teaspoons of a vitamin C powder that also has a little uh, lysine and proline in it for its uh, anti-atherogenic effect. And, of course, uh, I'm now on the supplement that I've talked about that we're developing uh, for uh, maintaining vitamin C blood levels. Uh, and my vitamin C blood level has doubled since I've taken that. So uh, all of those things. Hmm. Now, let's get on to the dental connection because you mentioned you uh, it was a bit of an epiphany for you to be working find yourself in Hal Huggins office and then be working with him and you've written several books can you and then sh sh coming from you as a cardiologist can you share with our listener what some of these dental challenges are well the biggest dental challenge is infection okay i mean there's been a lot of focus uh, initially it was almost the primary focus when i first met dr huggins but about mercury and incompatible fillings and I'm not here to demean that. Those are all important. Uh, I firmly believe that enough amalgam filling substantially increases your chance of multiple sclerosis and other chronic neurologic diseases as you get older. 
However, uh, if you have an infected tooth, uh, a, a root canal or a chronically abscessed tooth, and you have 12 amalgam fillings and you can only afford the extraction or you can only afford the amalgam filling removal, I say get the extraction. That's how much more important uh, these chronic infections are uh, in terms of impacting negatively your body-wide oxidative stress level, making you a setup for all the different disease processes. So number one on the list, statistically speaking, is now, in my opinion, for a long time I was going to say it was root canals because so many of them are done worldwide. Uh, and with the 3D cone beam exam, we now know and can show they're all infected, some of them much less severely than others. But we've also seen on this 3D examination that some 10 to 15 in some cases, 20% of all adult teeth examined with the cone beam examination reveal one or more abscesses in the teeth. And as I'm sure you realize as a dentist, one abscessed tooth is going to take you down. It's going to give you the heart attack. It's going to give you the breast cancer. It's going to accelerate whatever disease process you have going on. Very, very critical. But it doesn't stop there, unfortunately, because tonsillitis as a kid, you see big infected tonsils, it's very obvious. But this is what I call internal tonsillitis. When these you have the root canal or you have the chronically abscessed tooth and the tonsil has been draining those teeth for months to even years, and then those teeth get taken out, you still have chronically infected tonsils and they can single-handedly do the same damage as those teeth did. Unfortunately, they look normal. And this is what Dr. Issels found out in the 1950s. He, he found that 98% of his advanced metastatic cancer patients that came to him in desperation had infected teeth. Well, considering they didn't have the 3D back then, I think you can say that 98% is 100%. And then combine that with the fact that he still noticed when the teeth came out that a lot of patients still ended up getting heart attacks. Somehow, in a stroke of genius, he figured out it was the tonsils. Those started coming out too. No more heart attacks. And in Dr. Issels' words, not mine, he said 100% of his extracted tonsils were not minimally but were grossly infected. So uh, all of these things factor together. And as you've seen me saying several times here, the, the key, in my opinion, is this new 3D, relatively new 3D cone beam examination because there's just so many Panorex x-rays that just look fine. And you can take a tooth that looks fine maybe as much as 30 to 40 percent of the time and it's not revealing, not a minimal, but a gross infection. And the other problem with this is these infected teeth, also somewhat counterintuitively, are completely asymptomatic. Now, mm -hmm. how many internal medicine doctors have their patient walk into the office for the first time and the doctor looks at him and says, wow, Mrs. Jones, looks like you have a blood sugar of 330. Let's get you started on insulin. Of course not. They have to do the blood test. So how many people are going to walk into the office and the dentist or the physician is going to say, wow, it looks like you have several teeth that are severely infected, but you can't feel them at all. Let's uh, let's just go ahead and get them extracted. No, you have to do this test. And I would submit it even further that this is goes down to kids, too. I mean, when you have the child age five with leukemia, you damn well better sure better make sure that that child doesn't have one or more infected teeth or you're missing your only single chance to give that child a normal lifetime free from a great deal of suffering secondary to disease and treatment. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, that it's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge uh, area, uh, Thomas, and, uh, uh, and you're right. I, I must say the 3D cone beam, is a revelation. It's uh, it's actually quite frightening in many ways because we, we... excuse me. Let me let me interrupt here too because uh, to be very practical for a moment, 
there shouldn't be any endodontist, any implantologist, any regular dentist, any physician that should be resisted to getting this test on a routine basis because it increases the size of the pie. There's going to be more and more people with pathology that absolutely needed to be addressed. In the long run, you'll have more healthier people, but in the short run, the business is going to go is going to go sky high. So there there shouldn't be any of the almost reflex opposition to anything new because it's going to make the somewhat idle dentist a heck of a lot more busy than he or she is now. Yeah. Well, well, putting aside the busyness side of it, um, the the diagnostic. Uh We've we've found this in our practice so where we've been taking panoramic X-rays for many many years and and then uh, send off for full cone beam 3D and uh, getting a radiologist report and it's been very very sobering to us and and often taking a 2D X-ray which looks pretty good and then taking a 3D X-ray only to have something revealed that wow he just blows you away as a dentist. So I agree with you. I think I think it's a big thing. I mean, uh, of course, the problem is, as I think, as I said to you earlier about the black hole, the, the fact that the medical health professionals know almost nothing about it. And yet the and the doctors and the dentists are very, very focused on the minutiae on a daily basis. I often say if you went to see a cardiologist and he said, Thomas, uh, how are you? And you went, I'm fine. And he said, oh, okay, we'll come back when you, when you have any pain in your chest and we'll deal with it then. You would kind of think that's really not a very good cardiologist. And somehow we've equated no pain in the mouth with a healthy mouth. And you know what's maddening about that, super maddening to me, is it's even in the cardiologic, cardiological literature. I mean, think about this. They have a study where they did atherectomy. That's like a rotor rooter actually carving out plaque on known chronic coronary artery disease patients. They did this in 34 patients, and they found a whole wide variety of periodontal pathogens, DNA, fungi, viruses, you name it. Now, mind you, the car coronary artery should be sterile or near sterile, Okay. And guess what? Guess how many of those patients they found that in? 34. Last time I, I'm not big on mathematics, but last time I checked, 34 out of 34 is pretty close to 100%. So, I mean, all the cardiologists now accept that all coronary artery disease is caused by inflammation, but they won't peel off another layer of the onion. What the heck is going on? The, the other thing, too, about the 3D test, I think it's important that your listeners understand because uh, everybody, all the different dentists have, like, different routines. This test, as you've alluded to and you well know, has a ton of information on it. Mm. And you really must have uh, a qualified person. Uh, you talked about a radiologist. That's fine or a dentist who has specialized it, that's fine, but a qualified person to do the thorough interpretation on these studies for two reasons. One is you can get distracted and not pay enough attention to the teeth, and each of the tooth tips, tooth roots, need to be examined carefully for infection. And number two, as a very busy dentist, uh, you don't have the time to spend the half an hour to 45 minutes, which is how much, how long it takes to properly do and dictate a full interpretation on something like this. Yet, if let's say you do several hundred of these a year uh, and you miss somebody's malignant bone, smith, bone cyst and interpreted it as a normal study, you're, you're medical legally going to have your butt on the line too. So it's good for the patient. Uh, it doesn't add that much cost to the study. Uh, and it allows the dentist to do what he or she does best, which is remedying the situation once it's been identified. Mm. Uh, no, no I, I totally agree with that. I, that's been our, our experience as well. And I think what's changed too in the last – I mean, this whole discussion about dental connection has been going on, well, for most of the 20th century, of course, but uh, in the 90s there was a lot of research published about the link between gum disease and cardiovascular health, and that by association must include all infections in the mouth, not just 
gum infections. No question. And it's very frustrating and amazing, and I don't know if it's intentional or ignorantly, uh, that so few physicians, so few dentists uh, appear ready to make the not such a mammoth leap to understanding that if you have some slightly infected gums, how much worse is an infected tooth? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, combined with the fact that, of course, the teeth have the perfect delivery system. What do you do on a tooth, a big molar? You chew on it and you squeeze <laughs> the... Uh, the contents of it in directly into the bloodstream, directly the venous system, and directly into the draining lymphatics. Uh, I mean, you actually have a more efficient mechanism than if you took the toxins and the infection and injected an IV with a syringe. Mm -hmm. Wow. Look, we've covered so much territory and there's so much more we could discuss and uh, we're coming to the end. I just want to ask you now, just taking a step back from your role as a cardiologist, as a health practitioner, as an author, you know, because we're all on a bit of a health journey in, in this world. What do you think the biggest challenge is for people on their health journey through life in our modern world? Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, it's mostly financial. And I, I'm, I'm hoping against hope that uh, one of the things we can do with our political system over here and our current president, believe it or not, is very pro-alternative integrative health on a number of levels. And if we could just get a bill that would allow a patient to choose the health care they want and be reimbursed for it rather than be forced to do something else. Most people just don't have enough money to pay for $5,000 worth of IV infusions, but their insurance will cover $150,000 worth of chemotherapy. I mean, it's bizarre, but it's true. So the moment, uh, and, and most people, I mean, a lot of us don't think a lot about spending a couple hundred dollars a month for different supplements, but a lot of people, you know, they're tapped out after 40 or $50 a month. And so a lot of it has to do with economic freedom, to be able to pursue the uh, very apparent changes in evolving healthcare that you can read online and, and you can see coming about it. It's, it is, for the average person, I would say it takes a lot more now than just awareness of what's the best things to do. I mean, you know, you can follow a good diet and all, but still organic is more expensive. And, but still, the knowledge is the king. And and being able to realize what's good for you and still have the economic ability to do it, especially if you have three or four or five kids, uh, I, those are all important factors. So I don't have an easy, easy answer to your point, except to say a few simple legislative interventions, not just in the United States, but in Australia and around the world, reimburse people for the health care they want. And that would... That would that would actually bring the whole system tumbling down, the bad system, the the pharmaceutical centered system. But if just one bill like that could come out, you know, the Freedom of Healthcare Choice Act, I would call it. Terrific, Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Interesting to hear a cardiologist talk about the hidden epidemic of oral disease. As I mentioned, when it comes to the mouth in general and oral health in particular, it really is a hidden epidemic and sadly, the black hole of healthcare. Now, according to the statistics, over 90% of the adult population have some experience of tooth decay in their adult teeth. That is, the hardest part of your body decaying because of what you eat. The statistics for kids was something we dealt with in my conversations with Dr. Lewis Ehrlich, Dr. Stephen Lynn, and Dr. Sandra Khan. Go back to my website and search oral health on the podcast page. You'll find them there. Now, over 90% of the population also have gingivitis. That's an inflammation of the gum surrounding each tooth. And 
almost 50% have periodontal disease. Now, that's a more advanced problem of inflammation and infection of the periodontal ligament, which attaches the tooth to the bone. Now, I've referred to this as the black hole of healthcare, and almost everyone, almost everyone equates not having any pain with good oral health. Now, with almost 40 years of clinical experience, let me just say that well over 90% of all oral diseases has no pain associated with it. That is, no pain. So add to this that almost every medical or health practitioner's knowledge of oral health is minimum, and they often use the same criteria. If you're not in pain, your oral health must be good. You can see why I'm referring to it as the black hole of healthcare. If you have a health condition and you haven't had a comprehensive oral assessment done, then you may be missing a very important driver of disease and frustrator of health. What makes the mouth even more the black hole of healthcare is the fact that dentists are focused on minutia, literally. Quite apart from the challenges of working in the most sensitive part of the body, the mouth, on a person who is awake, may be anxious, is trying to swallow and breathe in a moist environment teeming with bacteria, and as though that's not enough, everything we do has to be absolutely precise. The fit of the filling, the adjustment of the bite, how well it's contoured, how smooth it is. So it's easier, it's easy for a dentist to be rather preoccupied with those very significant challenges. X-rays is another important point that Thomas made. And just to explain, X-rays in dentistry have always been a must. So much of dental disease, of oral health diseases, is hidden under the tooth surface or under a filling or in the bone surrounding a tooth. For 160 years, we had 2D x-rays. I'm sure everyone listening to this has had many. But Thomas referred to cone beam x-rays. Now, just to explain, cone beam x-rays or 3D x-rays are relatively new. First introduced into dentistry in 1988, it wasn't until really computer power and software made it more commonplace, certainly in the last 10, 15 years. Its main focus had been on determining how much bone was available for placing a dental implant. But its diagnostic value for identifying infections has become increasingly apparent and confronting. Now, as a dentist using this, I can tell you it's an absolute revelation. It can turn your world upside down. Teeth that you thought were okay or might be a problem you were, in quote, we just want to keep our eye on this, may actually have a chronic infection attached to it. And here's the thing. Depending on your resilience, depending on your immune system, depending on your genetic predisposition, that infection could be very significant with or without pain. And then there are some challenging discussions to be had and some even more challenging decisions to be made. It's a huge challenge professionally and personally. And in all honesty, I, I can understand why health practitioners, medicos and dentists might be dismissive. It upsets one sense of certainty about what you have been doing. It challenges you on many levels and it definitely makes your professional life far more complicated. You see, no pain and you're in good dental health. It's a very easy message to convey and one that you know as a practitioner will be well received by the patient. A seemingly win-win for everybody. But is it? I've often said health is very simple apart from two minor variables. And those variables, well, each patient is a human being and an individual. And on top of that, each health practitioner is too. So apart from those two variables, it's all very straightforward. It's why in my book and in this podcast, I think it's really important to identify and minimize what stresses our bodies are put under and have the potential to compromise our health. I mean, I identify five stresses in our lives, emotional, environmental, nutritional, postural, and dental stress. People are always surprised when they hear dental stress. But I like to say that I include dental stress for anybody with a mouth 
interested in their health, but has never fully connected the two. Now, you can decide whether you fit into that or not. It's not just identifying and minimising stresses in the system or to the system, but also to build resilience through the five pillars of health, sleep, breathe, nourish, move and think. Incidentally, we are starting an online course on those five pillars in a few weeks' time. There's a free plug. Well, Thomas has certainly elevated that hidden epidemic, the dental stress, He has written some great books and we'll have links to those in our show notes. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with 